Dave. That was great. Um, our next session is entitled Crossing Culture, how um, or Can Jesus Save the West, which is, uh, as you probably know, the title of uh, Kurt Marburg's book. So, Kurt, thank you. Thanks so much, Cody. Yeah, I was uh, very blessed by Dave to be asked to speak on this, the same topic as the title of my book, so I'm just going to read it to you, if that's all right. It's only, <laughs> only 300 pages or so. Um, but no... Yeah. Um, I've wrestled with those five words in the subtitle a lot, um, both before writing the book and, and since. Um, Jesus saves souls, we know that, he saves individuals, but does he save civilizations? Now, of course, when we ask this question, uh, we're not talking about individual transformation, we're talking about cultural and social renewal. Um, the Wilberforce example that Dave spoke on is a brilliant one, brilliant um, figure from church history and example for all of us today. So when we talk about Jesus saving the West, that's, I guess, what I have in mind when I use that phrase. We're talking about a society being the very best it can possibly be for everyone. Jesus' mission, mission to earth was the salvation of sinners, not societies. But history is clear that when Jesus changes enough hearts and minds, whole cultures are transformed. That's absolutely a lesson from history. Um, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is researching and writing a book on the history of revivals from the Book of Acts all the way through to modern Australia. And um, really exciting project. And it's very much the case. I can you know, vouch for this, and I'm sure if you've read any revival history, when Jesus changes enough individual hearts and minds, he absolutely changes whole cultures. Now, this was true of Australia at the beginning, the story we Aussies generally tell ourselves is that we are an immigrant society built mostly by convicts and other misfits. There's a general sense that we were born modern and more worldly than our British ancestors and that we've always kept religion out of politics, unlike those stinking Americans. But does that story about our past stack up? Is it actually true? Well, I think the answer to that actually is no, and I'm going to give you some reasons for that. Australia wasn't founded as an explicitly Christian country, but it was founded as a British country. It was a, a British colony. So we, were, uh, we did proclaim ourselves, even at Federation, as being proudly British. By definition, British meant Protestant. That came as part of the package deal. Now, it's true that not many convicts uh, who were brought to Australia were religious, but it's a mistake to project the convict experience onto all Australians, onto all the people who came here to live here. Convicts were actually only arriving here until about the 1850s. After that, that was the last convict shipped, and everyone else who came were free settlers. Both before that and after, huge numbers of free settlers came from England and Ireland, Scotland, Wales, um, and a lot of countries throughout Europe. Um, as one example of this, I grew up in Lobethal in the Adelaide Hills, and so um, that was one of many German settlements, if you know that kind of area of Australia. And it was founded in the 19th century. Lobethal is actually Martin Luther's translation of a word in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 20 verse 26, the valley of praise is talked about. So Lobi is praise and Thal is valley. Um, so it's the valley of praise. Like so many of Australia's free settlers, the Germans of Lobethal made it a priority to build a place of worship when they first arrived. And as you'll know, out here in the country, especially anywhere you drive in Australia, you'll see church after church after church. It was a, a major priority of the people who settled this nation to build churches whenever they arrived in an area. There was never a point in our past when, you know, every Australian was a Christian, or even when all of the Christians who were in Australia behaved Christianly. Um, it is a mistake, I guess, as Christians and as conservatives, if that's a term you use to describe yourself, it's a, it's a mistake for us to think there's some kind of golden age for us to return to. That's not our aim. You know, we're building for the future and Jesus is calling us into a better future, not somehow to the past. But when Australia was federated, Christianity was more or less a given. It was the air we breathed. It was kind of seen as this stable centre that we could, you know, sort of orient our society on. And it was, it was just a very taken-for-granted concept. So when, around the time of Federation in 1901, the percentage of Australians who called themselves Christians was in the high 90s. That's pretty amazing. And uh, during the Federation debates, so we didn't just kind of, you know, become a Federation out of thin air. This is something that was debated for, you know, some time before it happened. 
years and years. And Australia's Christian identity was a theme that was discussed a lot in the Federation debates. Our founders affirmed that uh, Australia did have a Christian character to it. And they did that by including this phrase in the very first sentence of Australia's constitution. They described us as a people humbly relying on the blessings of Almighty God. Now, there was quite a bit of controversy around this phrase being included. Thousands of Australians, uh, basically delegates, were sent to these federation debates from all of the colonies. And thousands of Australians petitioned their federation delegates to make sure this phrase, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, was included in the preamble to the Constitution. It was really important to them. And in fact, so passionate were Australians about this issue that historians suggest had they been ignored, had their petitions and their requests for this phrase being included been ignored, Australia may not have federated at all because so much hinged on it for the general populace. Consider what some of Australia's founders have said about Australia's Christian character. The father of federation, a guy called Henry Parks, said of Australia that our whole system of jurisprudence, our constitution, are based upon and interwoven with our Christian belief. This is not an American guy, this is an Australian founding father, father of federation we call him. Alfred Deakin, our second prime minister, declared that without God and without immortality, there can be no true or efficient morality from generation to generation, no task for the race and no goal for it to attain. It's pretty amazing. In fact, as the constitution was being drafted, Alfred Deakin prayed that the move towards federation may be the means of creating and fostering throughout all Australia a Christ-like citizenship. Now keep in mind what Queen Elizabeth II, our head of state, vowed in her coronation in 1953. This is obviously going back a fair way, but this is what she vowed on the day of her coronation. She said at that ceremony that she would maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel. She would also uphold the doctrine, worship, discipline, and government of the Protestant Reformed religion. That was the vow she took at her coronation. So the idea that Australia is a secular nation and doesn't sort of have God in the picture at all just does not square with the facts of history. As recently as the 1950s, only 10% of Australians considered themselves not religious. That's not that long ago, the 1950s. Now, it was only from the 60s that religious belief really did start to decline quickly, and that was the case in Western countries throughout the world. A large part of that reason being what Dave has shared with us about the kind of Marxist agenda. But all this to say that Christian ideas and beliefs and values have played a really important role in our nation all along. The Christian voice absolutely has a place in politics, so don't be ashamed of it. Well, so much for our origins, what about where Australia is at now? The process of the West rejecting God was very slow and gradual. One of, the favorite, one of my favourite chapters in, uh, that I had to write in um, Cross and Culture was chapter 2, which I called Goodbye God. And in that chapter, I explained over a process of about 500 years how our culture, how Western culture, forgot God and sort of removed him from our thinking. This might sound a little bit morbid to say that was my favourite chapter to write, but I think it is really important for us to understand how we got to where we are. It, it's very helpful for understanding where we are today. Now, we don't have time to cover 500 years of history tonight, but what about the last 10? Let's just kind of grab the last 10 or so for some context. Recall the same-sex marriage debates in 2017 and kind of leading up to that. Do you remember hearing quips like, what are you so worried about? If gay people get married, the sun will still rise and the sky won't cave in. Do you remember hearing that? I mean, I, I feel like I heard that over and over again. It was kind of this... Um, kind of scoffing remark to make you know, Christians sound like they're getting paranoid or whatever. But there was even a popular meme circulating at the time uh, along the same lines. It looked like this. Basically, if you can't read it, what will happen if gay marriage is legalised? The first one says gay people will get married. The second one is a third world war will break out. Then various plagues, locusts, frogs, etc. will erupt. Schools will begin teaching kids how to have gay sex and the terrorists will win. Now, obviously, they've, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a joke. They've got green highlighted. You know, essentially, what they're saying is the only thing that's going to happen is gay people can get married. But let's think about this. We've had uh, Russia invade Ukraine. We've had COVID-19. Um, number four is certainly taking place. And the terrorists um, in Afghanistan won. So, now, obviously, I'm having a little bit of fun with this. Um, but... 
The one that Christians and, I guess, other conservatives were quite concerned about was number four there, the sexualization of our kids. Now, that was joked about as though it was never going to happen, but that very much has happened. Um, In the Safe Schools program, I don't know if you remember that, a number of years ago now, that was a really big issue. There were websites and resources being linked to that were teaching school kids how to have gay sex and all sorts of other obscene things. Uh, More recently, here's our favourite media outlet. I talked about the ABC a bit last time, last session. But they're promoting more of it out in the open. They're saying, yeah, we do need to teach our kids how to have gay sex in school. Now, fortunately, in Australia, things aren't quite as bad as they are in the USA. I follow a lot of um, the sort of trends that are happening on this front in the USA, and it's getting pretty pear-shaped there. But what else has happened in this space of sexuality and gender and children? Well, we've got drag queens reading to children in libraries all across the country. I don't know if you followed that trend, but it's pretty crazy. Increasingly, we are seeing boys being allowed into girls' toilets and girls' locker rooms, um, and also men competing against women in sport and totally destroying the category of women's sport that was you know, created only in recent decades in order to pr- promote equality and promote you know, women being able to participate in sport in a, in a healthy way. We've got Australia's top health officials no longer able to define the word woman, which James mentioned earlier today. And we've got children who are confused about their gender and they're being chemically castrated and having their body parts chopped off. I mean, this is actually happening in Australia, for real. So if this meme could have been a little bit more accurate in its predictions of the future, it would have looked more like this. If gay, sex, uh, sorry, if, if gay marriage is legalised, all of these things will happen that I've just listed because that is what has happened. You know, we were told that the slippery slope towards these things was a myth. We were mocked for saying there'd be a slippery slope. And in fact, it was very, very real and we didn't heed the warning. Erasing gender, it turns out, from society's basic institution, marriage, does have huge consequences all the way down to little children and their innocence. It really does. Uh, just as a, a side note, I, you know, when I started blogging, it was around about the time these debates were taking place, and I wrote a bunch of blogs on the same-sex marriage issue at the time. And uh, they got quite a bit of traction. Some were, I think, shared and 20,000, 30,000 views in some case, which I didn't expect at all. Um, but I think the reason so many people read it is because I was kind of soft on the issue. I took a bit of a middle ground approach. I did stand for the no side and I made the no argument, but I sort of shrugged off this idea that there'd be consequences down the road. Now, I'm a little bit more staunchly conservative these days, and the reason for that is because I realised I was lied to. And um, I guess I'm trying not to be quite so naive anymore. But having seen this debate turn out the way it has and the results of it has made me realise it really is important what we believe and making our case publicly is is just so crucial. Now, the marriage and gender issue is just one example among many. Uh, Lots has been talked about today and I could list plenty more like the erosion of religious freedom uh, and free speech, the devaluing of human life, uh, you know, through abortion and euthanasia especially. There are huge changes probably coming on the horizon if we're not careful around things like digital identity and digital currency that will be switched off if you have the wrong opinions online. Um, you know, there's a few, a few things uh, for us to be thinking about into the future. What all of these issues point to is that the West needs saving. We need Jesus more than ever before. Every society is going to operate on some moral framework. There's just no way to escape that. Secularism has been our moral framework for the last 50, 60, 70 years, but secularism is not neutral. Secularism has its own values, its own principles, its own ideas and biases. And as we are learning, secularism is actually doing a terrible job at protecting women and children, babies and the elderly, the value of life, marriage and gender. It's doing a shocking job of protecting those things. And it's also extremely intolerant of anyone who disagrees. You know, Christians, that's a big accusation made against the church or against Christians, is that we're intolerant. But you look at secularism, I mean, it's just absolutely shockingly intolerant. Far more, I think, than the church ever was. Certainly in my lifetime, anyway. Our culture needs truth. We need a moral north star. The Bible and the Christian worldview do provide this. And we are actually, I think, in an amazing period of time when many secular people are waking up and realising the kind of train wreck that our society is heading towards without God. 
Uh, in my book, and there's a blog online as well, I think this one might be at the good source too, but I couldn't find the link, but I wrote an article about some of the well-known atheists who are grateful for Christianity. I don't know if you recognize any of those. Some are podcasters, some are authors. Um, John Peterson's not an atheist. He's actually come a very long way. He was probably agnostic before. Some of these guys are on the cusp of becoming Christians, and they've reasoned their way from just a political standpoint. They've you know, started with political commentary and interested in world affairs, and they've more and more realized that our society is heading towards a train wreck, and some of them are on the cusp of accepting Christ. That's how far they've come. So there is just an, an incredible opportunity before us. I've, you know, particularly online, had some fantastic interactions with secular people, been able to share a copy of my book with them and have some great conversations about God. And they've come at this from the same point of view. They started as being very secular, very worldly, um, very godless, and are just realizing that without God, we're going crazy and we actually need something stable, something solid to build our societies on. So there is... Uh, just amazing opportunities before us. God, of course, wants to reach everyone regardless of their politics. But I would argue that there's a special grace right now on secular conservative Australians. People especially who are affected by the COVID lockdowns and the mandates. Um, I think that it's a white harvest field. And if we're going to see revival in the, you know, in the near future, look very carefully at that community, what God does in that community, because I think there's some very exciting things on the horizon. One of the challenges we face in standing for Christian values is the way we are portrayed. Now, have you ever noticed that the secular culture can do all sorts of things, um, up to and including killing babies and castrating children, and that's just kind of progress. But if we push back on any of that, then all of a sudden it's a culture war. Do you see how that game is played? It's fine, it's progress if they do it, and if we say anything about it, all of a sudden we're the ones starting a culture war. Well, those are silly rules. So I was talking in my earlier session about being manipulated by tricks. That's absolutely a trick. Don't be manipulated by it. Another trick which I believe we're going to see a lot more of in the years ahead, so be warned, is the label Christian nationalist. Have you heard that label being thrown around recently? Well, it sounds really scary, and it's supposed to sound scary. It was designed to sound scary. The label Christian nationalism deliberately conflates or confuses two definitions of the label. So the first definition is this idea that either America or Australia, whatever country you're talking about, in our case, Australia, should become a theocracy where the Bible's rules become the law of the land, religious belief is enforced, under threat of punishment, and no other faith is allowed. So that's the first definition. And now, of course, any sane person is going to reject that position. I would never argue to defend that. And any Christian that tried to, to argue it, I would argue against them because I think that's absolutely insane. But the other idea that is being blended in with it is that Christianity is the proven, God-given foundation for public policy and that Christians should promote Christian values in the public square because it's, it's a good thing to do. But see, how they, what they're trying to do is they're conflating these two definitions in order to throw both out together. So you're a Christian nationalist if you want to violently overthrow the Australian government, but you're also a Christian nationalist if you just want to defend babies and you're against castrating kids. Do you see how the game is played? This is master manipulation. The people behind this are using the first definition to smear the second definition. They're conflating them to try to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The strategy is to make Christians sound like the American Taliban or the Australian Ku Klux Klan, a major threat to freedom, a major threat to national security, so that all Christian values have no voice at all. Now, there are quite a few news stories going around that are now playing this game. This is a mix of Australian and American and international media, uh, all talking about Christian nationalism. Most of these stories are very recent. That's why I say I think this is going to become a theme. It's going to, be have, going to have to be something that we start thinking about as Christians. But I'm suggesting to you that it's a smokescreen. Because what these people are really afraid of is having their demonic agenda exposed. They're afraid that Christians have woken up to the games that are being played and that finally we're willing to push back. The idea that Christians are going to push back is very scary to them, very intimidating. So in America, they're especially upset that Roe versus Wade has been overturned. That was a historic victory just, I think, what, a month ago, two months ago? Absolutely amazing. Millions of babies are now going to live. It's those despicable Christian nationalists who did that. And I think that's actually a lot, what a lot of this is about, particularly in America at the moment. But let's pause and think about this for a minute. 
By this crazy logic, you know, we're going to call everyone Christian nationalists just for having a, a public voice and, and saying that, you know, Christianity is the foundation to build a society upon. If that's the case, uh, then Henry Parks, Alfred Deacon and the Queen herself are Christian nationalists because they believe that the Christian faith is the foundation of a good political order. In fact, by this logic, if we're going to say that's what Christian nationalism is, by this logic, even the most left-leaning, progressive Christians are Christian nationalists because, see, they want big welfare nets because of their Christian faith. They want open borders because of their Christian faith. Um, they want high tax or race-based policies because of their Christian faith. So they're Christian nationalists too. So it's really absurd. That's what I'm getting at. See the tricks that are going on. If you define it the right way, if you define it by the second definition, Christian nationalism is actually a really good thing. It's certainly better than Christian statism, which says, wield the power of the church to try to enforce the rules of the state. That's a shocking philosophy. Amen. It's way better than secular globalism, because if the secular globalists get their way, we're all going to be living in pods and eating bugs for the rest of our lives. I would say those two ideas, Christian statism or secular globalism, they're far bigger threats than Christian nationalism is. In fact, I think the case can be made that Christian nationalism doesn't go far enough. What does Philippians chapter 2 say? It says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. It sounds like theocracy. If the whole world belongs to Jesus... If he is truly Lord of all, we should embrace Christian whole worldism, not just Christian nationalism. In fact, if all the galaxies belong to, to Jesus, what about Christian intergalacticism? Maybe that's what we should be going for. See, the universe works when it functions the way that God has intended. When the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets orbit and circulate according to God's path that he has set out for them and this is true at that massive scale it's also true at the level of humanity human societies work best when we function the way that God intended when we treat each other with dignity because we are made in God's image when uh, we follow his intentions for sexuality and for marriage and for gender and for human relations and how do we, how do we treat people and how do we live kindly with each other in the Great Commission, Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all the things I have commanded you. Teaching the nations to obey everything Jesus has commanded us. Did that command have an expiry date? No, Not as far as I know. Jesus said, until the end of the age, right? Shouldn't we want to see our nations functioning the way God intends? Shouldn't we want to be Christians living out our faith in public and letting our, our private beliefs influence our public policy? Absolutely we should, if, if Jesus means anything here. I don't know if you ever came across this quote by the infamous Richard Dawkins. He said, I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity, insofar as Christianity might be a bulwark or a defence against something worse. Now, he said this almost a decade ago, and he, when he was talking about this, he had a different context in mind. He was actually talking about um, Islamist terrorism or I Islamism, because that was a big threat 10 years ago in the West. Um, but Dawkins' concerns equally apply, I think, to what secularism has done to the West, or you could say neo-Marxism has done to the West. I would submit to you that so-called Christian nationalism is actually a fantastic bulwark against all sorts of terrible things that have happened. Christian nationalism is a great bulwark against boys and men being allowed into female-only spaces and sporting competitions. It's a great bulwark against treating the unborn and the elderly as if they're disposable. Christian nationalism, so-called, is a great bulwark against mutilating and castrating kids um, and against all sorts of other things. You know, so much confusion about gender, we can't even defi define the word woman. Christian nationalism, so-called, is a fantastic defence against mandated injections, where the state just tells you it has to get injected into your body every six months, or digital currencies, you know, where you can't spend your money online anymore. Now, I'm not necessarily saying we need to embrace that term of Christian nationalism, but I do want you to wrestle with it. You may want to stay away from that label, and if so, that's a respectable choice, but if you do, make sure that you explain what you mean by it and, and what you don't mean by it. Make sure that you're rejecting the first term of that definition, the ridiculous one. On the other hand, you may want to embrace that label, play the troll, have some fun with it. That's equally respectable. Again, make sure you define it according to the second definition, that Christianity is the proven, God-given foundation for good public order, for a good society to be built upon. 
the more secular our society has become, the more we as Christians have learned to keep our faith very private within the four walls, walls of the church, within just our sort of spiritual activities. Many Christians have adopted the mindset that saving souls is now our sole mission and the culture itself can just kind of go to hell. If the West is a sinking ship, our instinct has been to jump overboard, maybe save a few people on the way, but try to jump overboard, salvage the reputation of Jesus and things will be okay. And it's true, look, if the West as a civilization, if Australian society and the democratic order in Australia sinks, the church will continue on just fine. We don't need Australia, we don't need democracy. You know, the church and you know, the body of Christ has functioned in every sort of society through history. So it's not as though we desperately need to cling to any civilization. He has promised to be with us to the end of the age. Having said this, Christians do have a permanent mandate from God to do all we can to benefit the society that we live in, even when things are looking really bad. As believers living in the West, we are called to love the West and to love the West in very practical ways. Like the exiles in Babylon, God calls us to work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is Jeremiah 29 verse 7. That same idea is repeated in the New Testament in 1 Timothy 2 Verse 2, Paul says, Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity, not revolution. (laughs) This is good and it pleases God, our Saviour, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Now, returning to that analogy of your ship, loving the West doesn't mean laying out, soaking up the rays on the deck as the, the, um, and enjoying the luxuries of the cruise as the sink you know, the the ship, sorry, sinks into the depths of the sea. Rather, it means all hands on deck and doing whatever we can to keep our civilization afloat. If we are successful and the West is spared, it won't just be the church that continues to enjoy freedom and safety and justice, it will be everyone. The West is a ship, think about this, the West is a ship that has provided safety, welfare, refuge, affluence, opportunity to countless numbers of people through generations and generations. The West is a good civilization to want to save. So it is a good thing for us as Christians to want to save it. We shouldn't throw up our hands and think it's just all up to God from here. I like what William Booth said. He's the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, I am not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God. Wherever we go, we become a move of God when we obey the command of Jesus to be salt and light in this earth. To be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. As Jesus said, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The ultimate role of the church is not to preserve the kingdoms of this world. Our role is to advance the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And as his followers, we're not citizens of this world, we're citizens of heaven, we know this. But Jesus also said that the kingdom of God is already among you. It's in us, it's within us, it's amongst us. It's within our grasp. So as we seek first the kingdom of God, it cannot help but have tangible benefits to the world around us. We will be like light that shines in the darkness, showing other people the way. We're going to be like salt that heals and flavors and cleanses. That theme has come up so many times today and tonight. And in doing so, we are going to preserve our civilization for the benefit of everyone. Thank you.